Welcome to the new year. 2020 is over and we welcome 2021 with positive faith because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If we've been through the worst of times, then anything further down the road would not be a surprise. But we cannot be less prepared. How can we face our future? There's a saying, if you aim at nothing, you'll surely hit it. You aim at nothing, and you hit nothing. The problem with an aimless life is that you can be restless, but directionless. You can be working hard for things that don't matter, and hardly working for the things that really matter. This week is the best time to set up a plan for your life, because if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Planning your future starts with what you aspire for in life. We have to frame the right aspirations in life. Why? Because aspirations are what you want in life. It's what wakes you up and gets you out of bed every morning. It's what you live and die for. What you aspire for in your life is what we call goal. And why do we need to set up goals? Because goals are like a destination. It's a rudder that gives direction to a propulsion. Goals gives direction to your efforts. And the next thing, goals help you set up your priorities. Once you have a clear idea what is more important and what is less important, it becomes easy to set your priorities. Then you can focus on all your efforts to achieve your goals and prevent yourself from wasting time on something that is not that important. The third thing about goals is it supports decision making. When you have set goals, there is no confusion as to the direction you need to move toward. Whenever you need to choose between two courses of action, you can choose one that takes you toward your goals. As a result, Having our goals defined aids effective in decision making. And the last one, goals motivate you to act. Keeping your meaningful goals in mind motivates you to persevere. The joy of achieving your goals motivates you to keep working regardless of the difficulties involved. Now, what is the difference between goals and objectives? Goals are the outcome you intend to achieve, whereas objectives are the actions that help you achieve a goal. For example, you have a goal of finishing college, so it is achieved by working the objectives set by the school for you to follow which sets your course to a degree. If you fail on the objectives, you will miss the goal. And um, what are the goals that we normally set? Well, there are so many, but I'll show you three. We have personal goals. This goal includes physical health, involving diet and exercise, and hopefully it works this year, emotional and intellectual goals by reading and involving in activities that edify you emotionally and intellectually. The second one, we have professional goals. Goals we set to advance our careers and vocations, like going to a school for a degree, doing business, and accomplishing financial goals in the workplace. And the last, which I call, is relational goals. Everything in life is relationship building. We have business relationships, we have student-teacher relationships, we have employee-employer relationship, we have doctor-patient relationship, we have a boy and girl relationship, buyer and seller relationship, and if you don't know how to handle those relationships, it will show in Facebook, Instagram, and Yelp. There are only two kinds of relationships, social and spiritual. Social is your horizontal relationships with others, while the other is vertical relationship, that is your relationship with God, which is your ultimate goal in life. Why? Because everything can be taken away from you. All of those goals that you can achieve, it can be taken away, but not your relationship with God, because you will stand before God and 
have an accounting with how you do with this relationship here on earth beginning today. So planning your future depends on this. Therefore, you, number one, frame right aspirations in life. That's number one. Your highest aspiration in life should be your spiritual goal, pleasing God and fulfilling His ultimate purpose with you. Pleasing God was the number one aspiration of Jesus while He was on earth. John chapter 6 said, For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of Him who sent me. For I always do what pleases Him. Your goal is not even pleasing yourself. Don't you know that your aspirations are directed by how you define life? If you define life as pleasure, you'll do everything for pleasure and please yourself at all costs. Life will be endless parties and hanging out and going out. If you define life as a game, it's all about winning, winning, and winning. If you define life as having power, then it's all about control. It's the feeling that everything will not be right without you. If you think your life is having material things, you'll be working so hard to be more by getting more, more, and more. Your ultimate aspiration in life should be to please God and empty yourself of self like Christ. Don't you know that God's blessing is not for your pleasure, but through you for His purpose? Let me give you examples beginning from the Old Testament. God told Abraham thousands of years before in the book of Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. Then the Lord told Abram, Leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will bless you, and I will make you a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you, and curse those who curse you. And all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. God promised to bless Abraham to be a blessing to the families of the earth. He chose an ultimate person to accomplish his ultimate purpose. The purpose of God's blessings is to be a blessing. Now, the second thing I'd like to show you that it's not pleasing ourselves, but fulfilling God's purpose. Another example is the Lord's Prayer, as it's commonly called. The disciples asked Jesus how to pray because they witnessed the power of the Lord in signs, wonders, and miracles, multiplying of bread, feeding the thousands, making the lame walk and the blind see. They knew that the source of Jesus' power was on his prayer, and they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And the Lord answered in Matthew chapter 6, In this manner, therefore pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then he said, give us this day our daily bread. Here we see Jesus taught his disciples to pray for the earth first before their daily needs. It's divine purpose first before personal provision. Our greatest aspiration in life is to please the purpose of God first than our own. That we must not find security in the provision of God, but rather in the safety of the purposes of God. God's provision may give you security, but God's presence will give you safety. What do I mean by that? Because God's presence is always in His purpose. And He promised His disciples in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 to 20, He said, Go therefore and make the disciples of all the nations, that's the families of the earth, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And let me make this statement. The premise in the promise of His presence is in His purpose. Many times we ask, in the security of His provision, but not the safety of His purpose. We know that His purpose, where we can find His presence. 
Let's pass from the point of blessing and live according to his purpose, just like Abraham. That God would bless us so that the families of the earth will be blessed because of us. That should be our greatest aspiration, our greatest goal. Finishing a career is good. Making a living is good. Fulfilling the American dream is good. But pleasing God by accomplishing His purposes is making a life. It's a life worth living because it echoes and valued in eternity. The result of living a life of pleasing God is that God becomes a showcase in every case of your life. Listen carefully. Once you know where you are going, your life will matter. Because it doesn't matter where you are if you don't know where you are going. Now, let's look at the verse, how to please God. If that's our greatest aspiration, how do we please God? Hebrews 11:6 6 says, And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. So, we must make pleasing God as our greatest aspiration, our greatest goal in life. So how do we do that? Number two, the second plan, we must assess our faith in where we are. Where are you in your faith? If, if faith pleases God, where are you in your faith? Abraham, before God blessing him, was told to leave his land, his father's fortune, and everything comfortable and familiar. Genesis 12, 12 verse 1, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. That will take a lot of faith. What are you willing to give up for God? Where are you in your faith? How much are you willing to give up for God? There are two things that makes Christians stagnant in their faith. What are those two things that makes Christians stagnant in their faith? Number one, compromise. Don't let short-term pleasures forfeit your long-term goal. If there is a sin to confess, an attitude to change, an error to avoid, a vice to surrender, a fault to forgive, let it go. The second one is complacency. Complacency is that you have lost your favor in serving the Lord. Have you ever ass assessed yourself and asked, what fuel are you running on? Is it God? Is it goods? Is it good things? What are you passionate about? Have you ever assessed your faith? Are you rejoicing on the things that heaven would rejoice? Now, Philip Brooks said this, and I quote, Sad will be the day for every man when he becomes absolutely contented with the life that he is living, with the thoughts that he is thinking, with the deeds that he is doing, when there is not forever beating at the doors of his soul some great desire to do something larger, which he knows that he was meant and made to do. To make it clear that one should not be contented with his present state, because he is meant to do more than where he is and what he does. To leave behind your accustomed comfort and convenience and follow in commitment to God's purpose. Now, knowing this, that your greatest aspiration is to please God, then you must have an action plan. And what is that action plan? Number three, follow an action plan by building your faith. There's a saying, plan your work and work your plan. Again, Hebrews 11, 6 says, And without faith, it is impossible to please God. So nothing pleases God except faith. Therefore, to achieve it, we must embark in faith-building activities. Let me suggest to you two ways. Faithfully hear God's words. Because in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it says, Faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. Find avenues or ways wherein that you can build your faith by listening to the word. In two weeks, we're going to embark into a Bible study course in our care groups online, Anxious for Nothing. 
And what a wonderful way to start the year dealing with anxiety. It will build your faith. If you don't have a group, join one. The second thing I would like to suggest, religiously attend our online services. Due to the pandemic, Barna Institute polls shows that one in three practicing Christians stop attending church online services during COVID-19. So that's the first thing that you need to do. Find a way to build your faith by knowing the Word of God. The second thing, you'll be surprised that one way to build your faith is fully forgive. In Luke chapter 17, Jesus said, Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sin against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And the apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. The disciples were having hard times forgiving that they asked their faith to be increased by forgiving. The Lord from this verse shows that faith building has to do with forgiveness because offenses has to do with taking matters into your own hands. If God uses people to offend you in order to reveal pride in your life, you can trust Him with it. Resenting people could be direct rebellion, especially those who are in authority over our lives unless they are abusers. Let me show you a verse in action in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. The one who does not love his fellow Christian whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. If you really love God by faith, you must learn to exercise that faith by loving the one you can see. Faith is the ability to see chains in people's misconduct against you. Seeing the offender change and leaving the offense to God. You can really believe in the existence of God by forgiving offenses that God can either change the person and also the situation. He said, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. When you are offended and look for vengeance, then you're taking the place of God, and that is in a form of pride. So the more you find people who offend you, God is dealing something with you. Now, if you're going through tough times with people, God is building your faith. The fruit of pleasing God is peace. Proverbs 16 verse 7, it says, When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies live at peace with him. You can choose to be a preserver or a persecutor. It's up to you. A preserver of peace or a persecutor promoting aggression. There is a promise for those who pursue God's plan for their lives. God is seeking for people that will demonstrate His love to the earth. 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9 says, The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. Another one in Daniel chapter 11, But the people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. You see here, knowing God, you will do great exploits. So in summary, of planning your future is frame right aspiration by pleasing God. The next thing, because pleasing God is by faith. You have to assess your faith. Where are you? What is your passion? What is it that fuels your life? What is your excitement level? Faith pleases God. You must follow an action plan in building your faith. And lastly, form an attitude of Christ. That is the goal of everything. That is the goal of your life. That's the goal of God for you, is that you will reflect the image of Christ. Because God wants to see only one person in your heart when you get to heaven, if Jesus sits on the throne of your heart. So the fourth thing is, form the attitude of Christ or being Christ-like. Let me read in Philippians chapter 2, it says, Instead of being motivated by selfish ambition or vanity, each of you should, in humility, be moved to treat one another as more important than yourself. Each of you should be concerned not only about your own interest, 
but about the interests of others as well. You should have the same attitude toward one another that Christ Jesus had, who though he existed in the form of God, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a slave. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even on a cross. As a result, God exalted him and gave him the name that is above every other name. The Lord Jesus humbled himself before God and became obedient even unto death. And he humbled himself before men by serving God's purpose and serving people. Let me share to you one aspect of Christ's attitude. What is the benefit of being like Christ and having his attitude? Well, it's found in the beatitude. It says also there, one of them, blessed are the meek, or meaning humble, for they shall inherit the earth. I said, how can humility inherit the earth? How can meekness, meaning strength under control, inherit all things? That's found in Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. Blessed means happy. Meekness means strength under control. Now, when I look in Proverbs 16, verse 32, in the Berean uh, version, it says, He who is slow to anger is better than a warrior, and he who controls his temper is greater than the one who captures a city. One may capture a city. One may control the world. But if he can't control himself, he doesn't have anything. That's what it means. This is meekness. It has more power than the one who conquers a city or even the earth. Humility knows who is in control. We know God is in control. 2021 is uncharted horizon, uncharted waters, many unknowns. But let me quote, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. We may not know how 2021 looks like, but we know the final outcome. God will always be with us as long as we walk according to His purpose, according to His will, and being meek. Because meekness is knowing who is in control. That's why we can have self-control. That we will be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer, supplication, Petition and thanksgiving, we give our request to God, who is in control. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2 to 5, it also goes, When you go through the deep waters and great trouble, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned. You are honored and I love you. Do not be afraid for I am with you, unquote, says the Lord. We can go through the fire and we will not be burned. And we will go through the waters and we will not be drowned. Why? Because of His presence. Whatever you go through, or whatever we go through, He will make us through. God has everything in His hands. And God has everything and owns everything. The only thing that He cannot have is your life. Because you have to give it willingly. To take you to heaven, it would take a life as a sacrifice for sin. And He gave His only begotten Son to die for your sins and mine on the cross. You cannot save yourself. You cannot save yourself from your sins. You cannot atone for yourself. For only one can cleanse you from sin. It's the blood of God's only begotten Son poured on the cross at Calvary is the only way. That servant who died on the cross is coming back to be the king, judge, and ruler over all. So before you face the one who will make the verdict and sentence of your eternal destiny, why not make him a savior and king now, then a judge later on? Give your life to him right now. Why be in control of this world together with choices, chaos, confusion, and circumstance when somebody can do a better job? Remember this very well. This quote, If you leave everything 
in God's hands, you will see God's hand in everything. I will say it again. If you leave everything in God's hands, you will see God's hand in everything. God can do a better job. Just give your life to Him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we make you our highest goal in life to live according to your pleasure. Then everything will fall into place. Our faith, our future, our finances, our relationships will be in place. Our family will be in order. Marriages will bloom and prosper. Help us to assess our hearts aright, that our passion will be for nothing and to no one except by faith serving your purpose. That we can let go of the weights of sin that hinder us and we follow your call. Dear Lord, we want to build our faith in your words. Help us not only to be hearers but doers as well. Help us that our faith by increasing measure to be a blessing and encouragement to others. Help us that we can be transformed into the image of Christ who is meek and humble so that like Him we can live a life blessed in exalting You. We dedicate our lives to You this day, the first Sunday of the year. We commit our cares, concerns, and, and our very lives into Your loving hands to lead us for the rest of the years. Assure that whatever we will go through, You are with us. Your loving presence will lead us. Then Lord, we humble ourselves before You we subject our aspirations only for you, that we will increase our faith, build it so that we can be a blessing to others. That it's not about us, but it's all about you. Then do your work in and through us, Lord, that we can be an extension of your blessing. That the families of the earth will be blessed because of us. Then Lord, help us to be conduits of your love. Use our lives right now. Thank you for assuring us of heaven and help us to bring as many souls to heaven with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you and see you next time.